All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Oli Moldig. I'm a member of the vital team as well as a professor in the history department. I see many of you uh, were here last two, three weeks ago, and some of you are quite new. So this is a series that um, Derek at the Center for Teaching and Zoe LeBlanc, a history graduate student back there, and I have helped coordinate around the idea of finding a place for faculty and graduate students, instructors on campus to kind of share their experiences with teaching with new digital technologies. Those experiences can be wonderful, those experiences can be terrible. Uh, the idea is we tend to learn from one another about what works in the classroom more than we tend to learn from online websites or other forms of kind of teaching venues. It's one of the major things that came out of the Vanderbilt EdTech survey that we ran last semester. So this was an attempt to get those conversations rolling, what works, what doesn't work. In that vein, we have designed a few this, we did Twitter a couple weeks ago, we're doing Flip Classroom today, and next semester we have a couple of other ideas. But we really want to encourage you, our colleagues and faculty, to come up with ideas as well. If there's something you've done in the classroom that you think is really brilliant and you'd like to share with your colleagues, please <coughs> let me know and we'll organize something around that theme. If there's something you'd like to learn how to do, you have no idea why you should do it or how to do it, please come to us with that question as well. Um, so that's the, the spirit of the, the series of conversations that we're working on. And today, uh, Derek from Center for Teaching will introduce our three panelists. All right. A couple other bits of business. Um, one, we do encourage you to uh, tweet about the session during the session. Try to say nice things about our panelists. <coughs> if, you do um, if you do tweet, if you can just add this hashtag to your tweets, it's uh, hashtag VUDigiPed for, for digital pedagogy. Um, that way we'll be able to tweet pretty easily. And if you don't tweet and you just want to see what other people are tweeting, like me and Zoe, um, you can just go to Twitter and search, uh, use the search box to, to search for this and see what the conversation is. Of course, you're also here in the room having conversation and have opportunities for, for Q&A and discussion as we go. The other bit of business I would have is that um, we would like to have a record of who's here. Um, we just use this internally at the CFT so that we can kind of track our reach and things like that. So I'm going to pass this around, and if you can just either check your name if you pre registered or add your name. <coughs> um, there's also an opportunity here to sign up for the CFT newsletter if you'd like to get once a month emails from us about what's happening at the CFT. <coughs> All right. Um, today we're here to talk about the flipped classroom and hear some, from some faculty and grad students who've been experimenting with this idea, um, using technology to change up how they make use of class time. And so I think this is going to be a really interesting way to get uh, concrete about what this looks like in practice, what some of the choice points are. Um, and so I, I hope you'll engage with our panel today. Um, we're going to start off with Kathy Friedman, a professor in uh, biological sciences. Um, and uh, I don't know. You can yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Kathy. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm really pleased to be here today to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing for the last um, two semesters in my class. I'm kind of adding very slowly to, to my attempt to eventually flip this entire class. Um, I've been really helped in this, and it's on my thank you slide at the end, but um, by the BOLD program and Cynthia Brame at the Center for Teaching, um, I've worked with two graduate students, uh, Tessie Sebastian and Mary Keithley, who have helped me uh, not only institute um, some of these flipped lessons, but then we're also trying to assess the, um, the impact of, of these lessons on, on student learning. So I teach um, both a, an intermediate level genetics course and also an advanced genetics course. What we're, the course that I'm flipping is, is the um, sort of intermediate level course. It's really introductory genetics. The students have had a little bit of genetics um, in their first year biology class, but this is the first in-depth genetics class. And many students find genetics very difficult. In surveying my colleagues, that's not just us here, but genetics seems to rank as one of the more difficult classes at a lot of universities. I think because it's such a concept-based discipline, there is a lot of vocabulary that you need to learn, but in the end, what you have to be able to do is really to apply these genetic concepts to a lot of different situations, and it's that application that the students tend to really struggle with. They cannot possibly cram for a test in this class. It doesn't work at all. Um, and so the frustration or the problem that I was having is that there's just very little time to address really the application of these concepts in a traditional lecture format. And I would love um, every time you know, we'd, there'd be an exam coming up, and so I'd have an exam review session. And I thought when I'd have one of those review sessions, that was the most useful learning that happened. It was spontaneous. The students already had been introduced to the material, and now they were asking me questions about it. I was working through sample problems with them. It was very interactive. And I started thinking, gosh, you know, I wish that somehow most of my class periods could be more like a review session. 
And so what I'm trying to implement as the solution is to present 25 to 50 percent of the lecture material as short video segments um, before class. These are accompanied by multiple choice questions, again, that the students have to complete before class. And then using class time um, to introduce some new things, but for the most part to reinforce these concepts through either different examples or through doing very active problem solving in class, asking the students to work with each other, um, things like that. Um, so the way that we've decided to do these learning modules is by using Blackboard. It seemed like the easiest thing since we were already using that for the class. And so this is an example of one learning module that the students would see for one class period. So, th and they have to go through it in order, although I can't actually, they have to click on the video, I can't actually make them watch it. <laughs> um, but there's an introduction and then a video, that introduction and extensions to Mendel is a video. Then they get a um, multiple choice question, which I'll show you an example in a minute. Another video, multiple choice question. And in this case, there were four videos, each of about um, 10 minutes. So this is a Tuesday, Thursday course, so it's, you know, when I say 25 to 50 percent of course material, it's, it's a 75 minute class period. Um, and then at the end, um, they get an in-class question that we ask them to try to work through. It's a much more challenging question, and we use that in class as the basis for some significant class discussion. And I try to pick a question that kind of covers as many of the concepts as I can. Um, we also, the multiple choice questions they have to complete by 6 a.m. on the morning of class, classes at 8 o'clock um, or 8.10. And, um, but right after the questions disappear, an answer key comes up that includes the questions and a quite detailed explanation of the answers. So if students didn't get the answer, if they want to look at them later to study um, for an exam, they, they can go back and look at those. Um, and then. So I'll tell you in a second, because we've been assessing how this is working, they, we also asked them to take just a really quick survey about how they liked the, the module. Oh, and the students are getting one point of course points um, for each multiple choice question. So each of these modules then was four questions. And what we did over the, we did four of these modules this semester, and it just counted in, instead of giving them one of the problem sets that we used to give them. Okay, so I just wanted to real quickly um, play a little bit of one of these modules so you can see um, kind of the style that we use to do this. I don't know if you'll be able to hear. And epistasis uh, describes a particular situation in which the effect of one gene, so we might call that big A, um, masks the effect of alleles at gene B. And I know that's a little bit confusing to understand what that means, so let's just look at an example. One of the uh, most obvious examples of epistasis occurs with coat color in Labrador retrievers. You're probably familiar with the fact that labs come at, um, with either black, yellow, or chocolate coats. And this coat color is controlled, in fact, by two different genes that show an epistatic relationship. So gene B controls the uh, pigment color. Okay, so I'm sure you all want to learn about epistasis, but um, <laughs> so that just gives you an example of um, you know of the the type of thing. And this video was actually a little bit longer, but I go through and I explain several different examples of epistasis. Um, I'm just obviously flipping through this, and at the end we do have. Um, a little like key for them that they can look at to remind them um, about the, the core concepts. Okay, so um, and when, as I said, when they take each video, then they answer a question, and again, don't need to worry too much about the question. It's just, I, again, try to have the question be something that's not completely obvious from the video, but something that hopefully they have to have grasped the main concept that I was trying to get across in order to answer it correctly. And we do give them two tries to answer the question. And so if they get it wrong the first time, then they get something like this shown down here. So I say that's not the correct answer. And then I try to kind of lead them a little bit. So what phenotype would you get in a fly of genotype, you know, different genotypes? So they, it, to kind of help them, they need to think about that a little bit. 
Um, and then also sometimes I'll suggest, you know, here's the part of the video you might want to go back and review again. And they can go watch it as many times as they want. Um, so one of the, and this is something we can talk about in the question and answer session too, but one of the main uh, goals of the BOLD program is not just to create these online modules, but then to assess how these are working and how they're changing learning. So I don't have a lot of results to give you yet because we're still in the middle of our experiment. Um, what we've been able to implement this year, which I'm really excited about, are both control and experimental semesters. So my colleague, Dr. Mark Wolfley, um, taught genetics both in the fall and he's teaching it again this semester. I'm on academic leave. I'm not just <laughs> completely flaking out on my, uh, on my teaching. Well, I am actually just for this semester, but, um, but with uh, permission. And um, so in the fall, he taught the course in the standard way without the flip modules. And this spring, he's been using the, the modules. Um, we've administered both pre and post test um, concept inventories. Um, that, again, we did in the fall during the control semester and we're doing again this semester. Um, we've also asked them to draw meiosis on the first day they come into class. I always do that anyway, but, and then at the end of class uh, on the final exam, don't tell them, and, um, and so we're going to also score those. Um, some of the video modules we did were about meiosis, so we're trying to see whether we've helped them learn that any more effectively. Um, we have some student surveys, both immediately after each module, and then one, a more extensive survey we gave after the first exam. And then finally, we've done some classroom observations to capture how class time is being used with and without the flip module, um, and to classify the types of questions that students are asking, since we hypothesize that when they get the material ahead of time, that they may be able to ask essentially more sophisticated questions um, questions a little bit further along the Bloom's taxonomy um, when, when they have that kind of introduction first. So I don't want to take too much time. I know they said for me to take about 10 minutes. I don't have a watch up here, so I don't know how much time I've taken. But um, So I want to thank, again, the Bold Fellow Program, which is really a collaboration between the Vanderbilt Center for Teaching, the CERTL Network, and the Institute for Digital Learning, and particularly Cynthia Brame, who has not only um, help the graduate students who have worked with me, but also has come to class multiple times to help us with the observations. Um, and Mary Keith Lee has been working with me this year. Um, Tessie Sebastian worked with me last year on the BOLD program. It was just really overwhelming to institute both the changes in the course and think hard enough about the assessment in one year. <laughs> and so Cynthia, thank goodness, gave us a second chance this year to do a better job, more thorough job with the assessment. Um, and then I. Mark's not here, but I apologize. I couldn't find a better picture of him. Looks a little angry in that picture, but that's my colleague, Mark Wolfley, who um, has you know, very graciously uh, stepped in and you know, been, been the instructor um, through this project. And I don't really have a good segue to this. I just, um, somehow I had to show it because um, this has really been a great experience in my genetics classroom and hopefully gets the students' attention at least as much as when I can come to class um, <laughs> dressed up like Mendel. So <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So are we, are we saving questions for after yeah, everybody, or how are we going to do this? Can you talk about Mark's reaction to this when suddenly <laughs> he was faced with this? I mean, how did he, how did he deal with it? Was yeah. Was Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Mark's a really good guy, and he lets me <laughs> tell him what to do. No, it's terrible. We've team taught for a long time, so I think he knew this was coming. Um, I think it has been difficult for him, and um, especially this semester, because there is, you know, it's not just having an online module. It is changing what you do in the classroom that day. And, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure that everything that Mark has done in the classroom is exactly what I would choose to do if I was using the online module and doing it. Um, and, you know, I think that's partly because it, it is difficult when you're not the one who kind of devised the module and, and, and things. So um, he's been a really good sport about it, especially having us all traipse in and watch his teaching, which has also been a little stressful for him, I think. Um, that was the hardest part for me. So I did implement some of this last year in the class, and 
it is really easy to spend all this time making the module and thinking a lot about the module and then all of a sudden think, holy cow, I got to get into class in like four days and do something different than what I normally do because that's the whole point of this, right? And um, so that part is difficult. And what I did um, with, the, for example, this epistasis video, so the, the module was all about different genetic interactions, and I had used all the classical examples that are in the textbook, which I remember being so boring when I was a student. You know, the dogs, that's not so boring because they're cute, but, and squash and lentils, and you know, just all these things that you think, why do I care what color the lentils are? Um, and so what I did in the classroom was I found examples of each of those types of genetic interactions happening within human traits, either in human disease or um, you know, various physical traits in humans. And I presented these examples and then had the class figure out what type of genetic interaction was being illustrated in that example of human disease. And so I wasn't... Um, they'd already been introduced to the idea of the genetic interactions, but they had to, to identify which went with which um, in, the, in the class. And then we worked through this, this problem in an, active, in an active way. So, yeah. Question on the front row. Oh. So, when I first came into it, I don't know if everybody got that, but there's this audio and video recording release. So, uh, was this distributed? Oh, no, that's just for the speaker who was sitting there a minute ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so where are the pictures of the dogs and the people from, and the squash? Uh, those are from the web. Those are from the web. Yeah. According to this document, I don't think you should use them. Yeah. Uh, in fact, this is the most compelling reason I've seen to never do a flipped classroom. <laughs> So you're referring, the document in front of you is, is for this event here, since we are recording. Oh, and we asked our speakers to sign a, a waiver so that Vanderbilt could record this event. Um, I see. Yes. Your speakers. What about your audience? What about me? I'm making comments here, right? And I didn't know I was being recorded. John, do you have anything? Yes. <laughs> we can... Or we can edit you out as well. Okay, uh, because these are very stringent conditions. This mm -hmm. goes beyond working for Vanderbilt. This is like owning the persona, and so own the persona who presents it, and and also as soon as you take, according to this, anything off the internet, you have to look at copyright, right? According to this. Now, so there's a couple of issues here. One is, is the use of recording in a session like this, right? A live recording of a live session. Let's circle back to that in a minute. I want to focus, while Kathy's up front, on yeah. the classroom piece of this. Yep. Um, what kind of access uh, it, uh, have you made available to the videos that you've produced as part of this classroom initiative? They are access to those videos? the students. They're on Blackboard, so it's all controlled in the sense that anybody outside the class actually, the only people who can see them are the people who have registered for the class. Um, and so uh, this is where things get a little bit murky, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of what's allowable under fair use in a classroom environment, um, when I put together presentations for use in academic environments, I tend to look for images that are released in the public domain or available under Creative yeah. Commons, yeah. something where I know I have some assurances that I'm, that yeah. I'm covered. <coughs> now, in the confines of a classroom itself, instructors have much more latitude in, in terms of showing copyrighted material um, under fair use provisions. Once you move on to online, some of those rules change a little right. bit. Right. But given that the access is restricted through Blackboard to students currently enrolled in the course, there's still a fair yeah. uh, amount of flexibility in terms of the content that you can include in videos like this. Yeah. Um, most of the content you created yourself. Right? I did. Most of it, I mean, that's me drawing. Some of the pictures are often, I mean, I have an example where we talk about a dog and I ask that, you know, those are just some random person posted a picture of their dog on the web, so, um, or their puppies and said, oh, look, I have cute puppies. Um, so. But yes, most of it I create. They're either PowerPoint pictures or so. But it's a good, it's, I mean, that's a good yeah. point. My worry is not so much posting it on our sites for our students to access, but what happens if students are able to download that content and they can do whatever they want with it and there's 
stuff in my video that might be copyright okay for my students to see, but mm -hmm. worry about it going elsewhere and being a violation. Yeah. Me a law and order person, I don't want to do anything. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. I mean, uh, the, uh, my understanding is that aside from the content that you might include from other sources, the content that you create here is your intellectual property. Um, I believe that's standard process at Vanderbilt University. It may not be across the entire university, but I think in many cases it is. Um, yeah, I think you'd want to give your students some suggestions over what they should do with this, right? On some level, I think if the student takes some copyrighted material and posts it to YouTube, the, the student has some fault there, certainly. Um, but I think it's, it behooves us as yeah. instructors to give yeah. them some parameters and let them know. I mean, the thing I've worried about more than that is because, I mean, personally, I don't care if somebody can use it and learn from it. That's fine with me. But um, actually, one of the things I've worried about is that I don't want to have to rewrite these multiple choice questions every single year. Okay? And I do think that the most useful learning for the students is to present that answer key because if I don't, then especially if they got it wrong, what are they going to learn? They don't know what the right answer is. Um, or don't get an explanation about why that's the right answer. But, you know, I, there is nothing I can do at this point to prevent a student from printing those or saving them and then handing them to all the students in the class the next year. So, you know, I, part, and then part of me feels like, well, you know, it's not that many points in the class, and the student who does that or who takes those answers is either one, actually going to learn it because they're going to read all the answers, or number two, just shooting themselves in the foot by, you know, by not learning it. So I don't, you know, I kind of go back and forth on that one, but that is definitely a problem. I mean, we've done, we've done these kinds of questions just accompanying the reading for many years, and they would always just disappear because you know, the quiz is up there and then it disappears. And a number of students would say, you know, I really would like to go back and review those questions when I study for the exam. And so that's where this idea of providing an answer key came from. I'm going to jump in now because we have two other panelists. So yep. save your questions. We'll have more time at the end. Thank you, Kat. Okay. Yep. Um, we had But what it does is, as, as Kathy showed in her last slide, um, faculty and grad students come together as a team to design, implement, and assess an online learning module for use typically in a course here at Vanderbilt. Um, and so uh, we launched it last year. Kathy was one, in one of our, our, our first cohort. Um, if you want to find more information about it, um, I'll direct you to our website, cft.vanderbilt.edu. I'll we'll put that on the board here in a second. Emily Ann McCraney is a doctoral student in chemistry, and she is also in the Bolt Fellows program. She is the uh, grad student half of one of these uh, teams. And so she's here to tell about the flipped classroom project that she's been involved with. Emily Ann? Yeah. All right, so um, I've been working with Dr. Michelle Solikowski, and she's a senior lecturer in chemistry. Um, and so we've implemented the flipped classroom model in organic chemistry, too. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, organic chemistry is usually taken in the sophomore year, so they've had a year of general chemistry. Um, and so at this point, they've had a semester of organic chemistry. Um, and then this is the second half of that sequence. Um, uh, and so one of the topics um, in organic chemistry, too, is nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, and a lot of students struggle with this topic. Uh, it's the theory behind it is pretty difficult to grasp. Um, and one reason is uh, animations can really help with this. And when you're just looking at a lecture, um, static representations just don't really help you understand the theory with this. Um, and NMR is very much a problem-based discipline. So um, students would be given a problem, such as this to the right of the screen. Um, and they just have a bunch of numbers and lines, and they're suddenly asked to produce a structure of a compound. So they have to go all the way from understanding the theory to on the exam, now they have to do this problem and apply everything to solve the structure um, of a compound. And so this is a, a real problem area for them. It happens at the very beginning of the semester. And so we thought a good way to solve this problem would be to flip the classroom. 
Um, and so our, our method for doing this was we started with uh, preparation. So short videos were created. We tried to keep them in the time limit of three to seven minutes. Um, after seven minutes, students' attention span for videos really starts dropping off. So you really don't want to go too much longer than that if you can help it. Um, and so they were assigned these videos, these sets of videos to watch outside of the classroom before coming to class. Um, we did this for three days, so it was a week long of this, this one chapter um, um, in the semester. And so during class, um, we made worksheets. And so those worksheets specifically asked them to work through the concepts that were in the videos. Um, and so it started off with very simple things and then worked up to more complex issues toward the end of the workshop and toward the end of the week. Uh, and then the way that we assessed to see how this was working, like Derek said, this was as part of the um, BOLD program, so it was a teaching as research project. So we focused not only on how to design this, but how to see if it was actually working. Um, so assessment was a big portion. And we did um, online homework, so they have sapling learning. They had done this already the previous semester, so they go online and them. They have as many attempts as they want. They lose points for each attempt that they have, but they have all these questions and they attempt them. Um, so that we can get a number of attempts, we can see what their incorrect answers were. When they get the answer incorrect, they get feedback for why it was incorrect. And so um, we had this nice format already built in for us that we didn't have to create. So that was really nice. Um, and then we were also interested in seeing how students were going to respond to this change in format. Um, Myself as a student, I really wouldn't have liked it very much. I was used to a traditional lecture format, um, and changing it up, especially in the STEM disciplines, I think is, is challenging, because your students aren't expecting that. You have to cover a lot of content in a short amount of time, and it's difficult um, to change their expectations. Um, so in the first semester, we designed um, the videos um, and the whole module. And some of the design elements, we read a lot of papers and tried to get best practices of online learning um, and teaching. And so some of the things we talked about were um, like length of videos, like I've already talked about. You really want to keep them short to maximize student learning. Um, something I did that you can see in this top one up here is at the beginning of every video and then sometimes during the video when I was just talking, I put my face back up in the in the video. So it provides a more personal feel and helps to engage the students more than just a voice over PowerPoint. Um, Khan style tutorials like Khan Academy, those are very effective for students. So such as this bottom one down here um, where you actually draw and they can see you working through problems like they would want to work through problems. Um, those style of tutorials are very um, good for teaching students. It's a personal feel and they kind of get the flow of how to work through a problem. Um, as I mentioned before, animations are really useful for teaching this topic, and that's something that you can't do on a, on a chalkboard or just um, in a lecture format very easily. Um, and then another thing is that when you're doing the animation, you want to do the animation and narration at the same time. They found that um, speaking and getting things through the auditory and the visual at the same time is very important. Um, so we tried to use all of these design components as we made our modules. So it was designed very specifically. And then we assessed it um, and got our results. And a little bit disappointingly and surprisingly, um, there was actually no difference between the experimental and control groups. So um, on our x-axis, you have the number of attempts for each of these questions. And it's broken into the difficulty of the questions, so whether they're easy, intermediate, or difficult questions. Um, and then the control groups are in green, and the experimental is in blue. Um, and you can see there really isn't a difference. They pretty much most of the students got it right on the first attempt. Um, we think maybe looking at different, if we had looked at exam data or something else, that may would have helped us. But um, we only looked at homework, the online homework. So we didn't see a difference with that. <clears throat> when we asked the students in that post uh, survey if they, what their perception was of the flipped classroom, so we asked them to choose one of these four responses. Either they liked the classroom and it helped them, they didn't like it but they still feel like it helped them, they liked it but it didn't help them, or they didn't like it and it didn't help them learn. <laughs> so as you can see, the majority of students, whether they liked it or didn't like it, felt like the, the flipped classroom helped them learn the material. Um, so that was encouraging to see, even though we didn't see those results necessarily in our data. 
Um, we did have a population of students, about 18% of them, that didn't like it and absolutely didn't think it helped them learn. Um, and I think that um, can be chalked up kind of to student resistance. Um, and so that leads us to another kind of interesting thing. And I, I think this, I may have had resistance to it as a student as well, but we, in the pre and post module survey, um, we asked them what the most important use of class time was. In both pre and post module, the majority of students said that lecture, like the traditional lecture format, was the most important use of class time. Um, so we weren't able to sway them from that at all. Uh, and then we also asked them some open-ended responses, um, or asked them to give us some open-ended responses about the module. Um, some of them are, are kind of what you would expect. It's a change in format from what they're used to. So it forced me to learn the material ahead of time and then practice in class. That's what we wanted them to do, but that's not really what they wanted to do. Um, it was harder to motivate myself to learn the material. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, and I've added the emphasis here, but they didn't like not having lecture in class, and class time almost felt wasted, even when I learned things during that time. <laughs> <laughs> That, I, th I think that just speaks to like how they weren't sure about the change in format. And we only did this for three days, and I, th I feel like if they had done this for longer, and maybe if, maybe if we had done a better job on the front end explaining, you know, literature backs this up, this is, this is good for your learning. We've, we've really spent time designing this. Um, and then this last one, I can understand, and um, I get it, but the main criticism is they don't see their tuition money at work. He felt like he was watching YouTube videos. and um, So I think we have to work to help the students understand that, yes, maybe right now you don't see like the value of a YouTube video, but you know we put more effort into making this YouTube video than maybe your traditional professor would put into an hour-long lecture. It's, it really took a lot of effort and time to do this. So. Um, there was some student resistance, and so I think we just have to um, take some time ahead of time to help prepare students um, for what they're going to be experiencing. So just in conclusion, um, there wasn't a difference between the control and experimental groups. Um, like I said before, I think we could have used different metrics um, or maybe even stratify the students because the literature shows that students that perform poorly, generally the flipped classroom helps them more. Um, student resistance may have played a role. And we asked the students for suggestions, and one thing that a lot of them suggested was a mini lecture. So if that helps to kind of ease them into the format more, maybe that's, maybe that's what they need. Um, they also, several of them suggested in-video practice problems, which is very useful. It's um, very similar to what Kathy did. Um, and I think that would have been a very good thing to do, something to help them solidify the material before coming to class. Um, so future work, we'd like to try this again, improve the mo module, um, again, help ease the students into it a little bit more, um, and refine our experimental parameters. Uh, question or two for Emily Ann. So I was curious when you when you asked the questions of the students how how useful did you find the flip model if I understood it? Did you ask it in such a way that it was clear it was relative to how useful you would find a lecture? I mean, if you asked the same question about a traditional lecture, might you have gotten the same percentages? Um. So like that, I liked it and I learned. Or we didn't ask it compared to a traditional lecture. No. So that, that's, that's very true. We could have gotten, should probably should have worded our question a little bit better. So you did get some responses saying, we wish we had more lecture. But in terms of yes. that, that particular question and the answer choices, it wasn't a relative right. question. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I'm a little concerned that in this kind of survey, you start before the empirical evidence with the assumption that the flipped classroom is better. And then what you find is there's no empirical evidence that it's better, and 60% of the students disliked it. And your interpretation seems to be that the students were wrong. Is it possible the students were right? Well, so about, well, if we go back to that graph, about 60% of the student, well, 70% of the students say it helped them learn the material, right? And so, 
the literature suggests that active learning, right, is the best way to go. Maybe the way we did this, maybe it didn't help them learn. That's possible. Um, I teach recitation, and so, and even with talking to other recitation TAs, when we went to recitation that week, we could see a huge difference between the control and the experimental groups. The, the experimental group was teaching the control group how to do the stuff. Yeah. Now so, that's useful in yeah. empirical data, so yeah. that would be cool to highlight if you right. talk about this again. Yeah. And, and I'll just add, often, so there is a pretty robust literature around the value of the flipped classroom and active learning in general, right? And so we would expect to see good mm -hmm. results in terms of student learning. Um, I've also talked to a lot of faculty who've done this kind of work, and often when they use the usual measurements of student mm -hmm. learning that they have been using, sometimes it doesn't capture the value, right? Um, and so if you, if you assess different aspects of student learning, you, you sometimes see that come out more, more strongly. I'll also add that it's your first time doing it, right? And so even if it, you know, it may work fantastically well by your third or fourth time, um, sometimes the first time is a little bit rocky in terms of implementation, mm -hmm. even of a strategy that's known to work really well. <coughs> Jeff? So I have a little bit of a different take on it. Um, you're dealing basically with undergraduate students who are lectured to all the time. That's the set of expectations they come with. And they show up in a room like this and they expect to be entertained for that 15 minute period. And when you do something that is different than that, you create a kind of a cognitive dissonance here in terms of what am I paying my tuition for. I think that if you were, I, I, what I'm getting at here is I think that this is more a maturity and experience issue on the part of the students than it necessarily is on the part of the faculty here. Um, I teach older students and I teach statistics, almost all of it online, and the results are completely different than this. I mean, they've been very unsuccessful in statistics. They take my course and they're very successful in statistics, and you see it in the course evaluations. So I, I think what you're really dealing with is a maturity issue. And in 10 years, we won't be having this discussion. I do think the expectations that students bring to the classroom matter a lot, right? And I've seen this in my own classroom. When I ask them to do things that are not the norm for their math or engineering courses, um, there's always some pushback. And I will always have maybe 5 to 10% of the students at the end of the semester who are still unconvinced that what, what they did was very helpful. I want to move on. You mentioned older students, and so I think that's a nice segue to Jesse. Um, thank you, Leanne. Yeah. Can we, turn, can we turn this off? Uh, yes. We'll yes. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little bit different. One of the reasons why I flip my classroom is because I hate lecturing and I hate PowerPoint. So um, that's why I'm putting the screen up and that's why I don't have slides. Um, so I did, uh, I flipped my classroom um, uh, last year, um, and also I've now done it for the third time. And my approach is not that different from what, what was just given. It's not, but I do want to, I guess one of the things that's important for me is that I don't really think a flipped classroom is really all that radical, right? Like we're telling them prepare ahead of time and then come to class prepared, and if you come to class prepared, we can talk about things that are perhaps a little bit more interesting, right? I mean, that's like vintage 1960, I think, right? I mean, like this, this is the way it used to be. So, you know, I think the videos catch their attention a little bit, and maybe it's a little bit easier to sell. Um, and I do have videos, but I also have written stuff. So I actually give them um, a, a kind of an array of things that they can choose how they prepare. Some of them are videos, some of them are written articles. Um, and, uh, and so I teach in a classroom kind of like this. So this, this is about my class, what you're looking at here. This is about the number of students. This is about the environment that I have. Um, I'm teaching uh, corporate valuation, which is a finance class to MBA students. And uh, they are older. They're all, uh, well, they're not entirely. So some of them are MSF students, which are usually right out of undergrads. So they are older than undergrad, but sometimes they are right out of undergrad. And uh, that's about half my class, and the other half is MBA students who are usually in their mid to late 20s. Um, and so uh, what I do is I have a very heavy case-based course. We do lots and lots of case studies. And so the way that I've set it up is ahead of 
ahead of a, a module or a topic, kind of like what, what Catherine was talking about, we all, I also have modules, is they have um, a handful of, uh, I, I give them some readings. Um, they, we have, I also give readings from the text, and I also have videos, and I basically tell them to choose what they want. They're, they're, I kind of tell them ahead of time. These are somewhat equivalent and somewhat overlapping. The videos are probably the shortest, quickest way to get to the core of what we're going to talk about. The articles are maybe the next most complicated, and the textbook is probably the most in-depth. So you kind of choose your level of kind of how much you want to do uh, in order to prepare, but you got to do something. And then the way I do assessments is instead of having a multiple choice question, I, have, I also have an, on, I have an online survey that I use, which just has two questions on it. Both of them are open text. One says, um, summarize the topic, and the other one says, what questions do you have for me? And that's it. Okay, and, and it all gets dumped into an Excel spreadsheet uh, using Google Forms. And again, mine's also due at 7 a.m. I teach at 9.40. So I can be due at 7 a.m. instead of 6 a.m. But I have found so that that's actually pretty important. If it's due at like midnight, then um, you find that you get lots of submissions right before midnight because they're all staying up for it. If you make it at 6 a.m., you get a lot fewer of those because usually they're staying up kind of late, but they sort of start trickling in and you'll get one or two at 3 a.m. And then you'll get maybe five people that are the early risers, maybe, that are submitting right before, instead of, you know, 100 all trying to submit at the same time. Um, but then I have some time before class to, to look at what it is that they've summarized, to look at what their questions are. Because for me, the flipped classroom is very intertwined with just-in-time teaching. So a lot of what I do is I, I actually shift my lecture based on what those questions are. So I can see what the questions are, what the gaps are, what they didn't understand. And, and I can focus what we're doing in class on that. Because a lot of what we're doing in class is case study examples. So they also have to read, I didn't, I didn't say this before, they also have to read the case ahead of time. So we're learning the topic in the context of this case. So there's a case that has a learning goal of helping them, you know, put themselves in the place of a protagonist that has to solve a certain problem using quantitative methods. So finance is pretty quantitative. They're generally, these cases require them to build out spreadsheets. So they've got Excel, they're computing, you know, cash flows for firms, they're looking at financial statements. It's not, it's certainly not technical in an engineering sense. I have an engineering undergrad. It's not technical like that. Um, but it is computational in a nature in that it requires spreadsheets. Um, and so that's challenging for them. And, uh, and so they, we, we go through that in class. Usually some of them have tried ahead of time. They know what the problem is. And so I'll usually take two days to go through some of this. And we'll, we'll start the case. We'll set it up. We'll make sure they know what, what is the problem to be solved. I'll ask a lot of questions of, well, how do you think they can solve this? Well, that's a problem. How do you think you can address this? We'll, I'll sometimes stop the class and say, all right, everybody get in small groups. And why don't you discuss this a little bit? And I try to circulate around. If I see everybody's kind of stuck at the same place, We'll shut it down and I'll come up front and maybe do like a little mini lecture so that I can hit everybody all at the same time and then we'll go back to the problem and keep moving. And then at the end of the day we'll try to wrap it up and then we'll do it again um, probably the next, the next class. So I usually have these two class, um, two class setups where we're doing it kind of a little bit more instructional on the first day and a little bit more purely let's solve the case and talk about the answer on the second day to hopefully add a little bit of uh, a debrief to it. And then um, at the end after that they have to, they have groups and they have to turn in um, a write-up of the case itself. So they actually have to, it's almost like they're writing a memo to their boss of, you know, here is the situation, we're going to write this all up and tell you, you know, we've done this analysis, here's what we think you should do, um, et cetera. I think originally when I did it this way, I was really worried that I'd be basically giving them the answer in class. Turns out, not that big a problem. I still had a nice big dispersion <laughs> on what the answers were, even after, you know, two full class days of kind of support and me basically answering whatever question they wanted me to answer about the class. I did feel like I was giving them the answer a lot, but I think you've all probably had experience with that, where you can flat out tell them what the answer is, and it still doesn't always quite absorb, at least not in the moment. So I haven't had a lot of problems with that. Um, so that's, that's my basic experience and the way I've set it up in my classroom. Um, I will also say I've also seen resistance. So I've got um, usually, kind of like more like what Derek said, not the 18%, it's usually in the 5 to 7% of people that'll say, Stuff like, you know, this class was terrible. You should just lecture at us. We're not getting our money's worth. I've gotten that comment um, and such like that. But uh, I, I, see them, I see them as a minority. I also have noticed I've gotten several comments before um, to, to what Emily Ann was saying that um, multiple students have said that at first they were skeptical and at first they didn't like it. But because I persisted with it the whole time, by the end of it, they really liked it. And I think it just takes them a little while to get used to the idea of what we're doing. Um, 
And I've also now done it three times. So I've, 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 I, th I also feel like I've gotten better at it as I've done it more. And I think, Kathy, that's probably your experience also. You do, you do get better at it. Because your class time gets a little bit more complicated. I mean, as you can tell, I don't know if this came through. But um, uh, classes can look really different because I'm, I'm shifting things based on what's going on with the students. I have generally have like a, a portfolio of things that I could potentially address. I have multiple different examples, and I may use one in one class or a different one in a different class, depending on what's going on. Because a lot of what I'm doing is I'm, I'm shifting and adapting as the class goes, th goes, uh, goes forward. Um, so that's my basic pitch. I also, I meant to look at the clock, but I don't know if I went 10 minutes or not, but I'd rather answer questions anyway. Okay. I've, I've, flipped, I've flipped a few times yeah. too. Uh, yeah, actually, can we stop? I'm actually curious. How many people would say they have attempted this themselves? I'm just curious. Ish. Okay, yeah. How many of you teach in the humanities where you always have students do work before class and then discuss it during class? Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, I did want to point out, you said it's not a new idea. Yeah. I think I, in some disciplines, this is a very different way to think about class time. In other disciplines, like English, having students do the reading before class and discuss it during class is pretty much standard, right? If you flipped your classroom, your students would read silently during class and then talk about it online after the class. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know that you want to do that, right? right. So, well, asynchronous exchange outside of class is kind of that. That could be helpful as well, right? But um, so, so, yeah, thanks for asking that question. I think that's, that's some good context. Jamie? I'm just curious, and this is kind of a question for everybody, how class size affects this? Because I have 220. Yep. And I flipped a couple times. I can't circulate to all my groups um, within, you know, the class period time. To me, it would work better if I had less than 50 students. Um, and then, you know, also, I think how vested, quote, the students are. I teach a non-major course. Um, and I think that really, you know, I have trouble getting them to watch the videos. Mm -hmm. And even though I can tell whether they click, I, like you mentioned, I don't know if they actually watched it. Um, right, I don't know that so, there's any you know, way just for some <laughs> that those Not really. Class yeah, size. So let's talk about class size, and then maybe if you have thoughts on the kind of compliance issue as well, that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, so I talked about my classes are kind of like this, and I'm generally able to make it around, but this is kind of big also. It's kind of hard to make it around to everybody. Um, uh, with the class of 200, I mean, uh, yeah, with the class of 200, that's kind of a different ball game. I mean, I think you just have to, to me, that's a matter of using a different approach to gather feedback, right? So I'm using, I'm using my feet to circulate and gather feedback, but I think there are other mechanisms, you know, our friend Derek has written an entire book on clickers, right? On how you can use, you know, clickers, or I also use pull everywhere in my class. You know, sometimes I just want to put a question up here and you can get everybody to get, get out their device or whatever and they can send you a text message and you can pull the class and kind of see how's everybody doing? What's, what's, does anybody have an answer to this yet? And I, so I think you can use, you can potentially use things like that to get the feedback you need to find out, is everybody stuck? You know, are we actively working? Are, is everybody checking Facebook now? Or are we still, are we still working on the problem at hand? Um, it, you just have to think about it a little bit differently in those large classes. You guys have bigger classes, right? Yeah. Well, mine hasn't been, but so genetics is really lopsided for some reason. So it's offered both semesters. That's why we've been able to have this control semester. And it's about 90 students in the fall, but only about 35 in the spring. I think that's the starts at 9 o'clock in the fall versus starts at 8 o'clock in the spring. <laughs> but, um, and so we've implemented it within this little bit smaller class, but honestly our classroom is not such that you can move around and go see individual students. There's no aisle in the middle, so we don't have that option. You can still easily ask students to confer with their neighbor mm -hmm. or the person around them, and then ask a group to report out, which I think is less um, intimidating to them and works better than just saying, does anyone have an answer? So I'd say that one of the things Mark had a lot of trouble with was asking questions and the students would just be sitting there and I'm like, I know they know the answer to this. You know, I know several of the students in this class. I know they know the answer. But nobody would raise their hands. I think you also have to sometimes just, just call, cold call people. And if they know that could happen, then they'll come a little bit more prepared. I do... So what you're, I have an advanced course, too, and that's only usually 12 or 15 students, but they have to read ahead of time. It's all journal articles. So it's not flipped in the sense that there's a video or anything, but there's an implicit assumption that they come having read the paper and thought about a list of questions that I give them. And it's all calling on students the whole time in class. And then they really come very prepared and ready to talk. 
so for our class, it was about 140. So it was very large, and it was in a lecture hall where almost all the seats were taken. And so one of the student complaints was there weren't enough people to answer their questions. So there was myself, um, Dr. Slokowski was the instructor, and we had two other TAs come in and help us. So there were four people circulating the room answering questions, um, and they still felt like there were always people with their hands up. So it was very difficult in a class that size to answer questions. Um, and as to your question about like watching the videos, they stopped watching them on like the third day, and we noticed because we could see the YouTube analytics, and I noticed that nobody had really watched some of them. And she just sent out an email that said, "Big Brother's watching the views." Let them think I knew. Yeah. Now, I really like the procedure model that had the questions embedded within the video, so you had to actually watch the video to answer the question, and that would be. Beautiful, and if it would, you know, integrate, I mean, go right into Blackboard as a quiz, that would be. One thing I didn't mention is that I, I, we do have some of our data in, and 70% of the students, after we um, surveyed them after the exam, said they went back and rewatched videos while they were preparing for the exam. So that made me feel really good that they were using this as a, as a resource. Um, I'd also say, well, uh, a couple things. I think one, in classroom, you have to act as if they have done the pre-class work, right? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna recap all the stuff from the pre-class work in the first 20 minutes of class, you will train the students not to prepare for class, right? And also in the surveys that I've seen, um, in more traditional models where you just kind of ask students to read the textbook ahead of time before lecture, compliance rates are in the five to 10% range, right? Most students don't read, at, in the sciences at least where I've seen this, right? I mean, it may be a little bit, hopefully in the humanities it's a bit higher, or that's the, the standard model. Um, and so I think that's part of the compliance landscape as well, is kind of what do students already do before class? Um, and how can we um, ask them to do a little bit more so that you can use class time in different ways? Other questions in the back? In general, if you had to respond to what you know now, you wish you would have known back when you first started, what kind of guidance would you give? I guess I would say like most other things that you, you, you have to be patient, right? You're, you're trying to teach and do something in a new way. You can't expect that you're just going to knock it out of the park on the first try. Um, and kind of a corollary to that is, you know, maybe start small and move into it instead of do some sort of a big bang type of thing. Because um, uh, I, I do think that I've definitely gotten better as I've done it more. And I've gotten more comfortable with it. And there's, the, there's a level at which I'm a better teacher when I'm more comfortable, right? So at first... I kind of wasn't quite sure what I was doing, and I would get caught off guard by some questions, and I didn't always have the right example that I wanted. And, and now more and more, as I've done it enough, I've built up over time a portfolio of things such that I just have a much higher comfort level in class, and I think that translates into me being a better teacher, being more prepared, being that, exp and that experience, which then translates into the students being more engaged and the students participating more. But it's, it's just taken time. I don't think there is any magic formula. I, mean, I think for me, I mentioned this before, the biggest problem was just spending so much time making the module and sort of forgetting until almost the last minute that I needed to think really hard about what I was going to do in class. And, yes. um, and you know, I think for me, that was, that was the, the hardest thing and the thing that I think will continue to be a, a challenge. Um, I will say last year, you know, you can do this kind of part way too, and I think it's still somewhat helpful. So last year we had made, Tessie and I had gotten just one module made, so that was just for one class period. But it was so helpful and the students seemed to really like it, and so I actually got a little bit behind in my lectures, and so I would just make a video, but without all the multiple choice questions and everything, because that takes a lot longer to put together. And I used those videos as we went on, and again, I think they enjoyed having those, and then we were able to take those videos and put them in the context of a module for this year, so that you, know, you don't necessarily have to think, okay, I need to spend you know, six weeks doing nothing but sitting down and designing one of these modules for every class period. I'm kind of building them as I go, and it makes it less um, arduous each I think I would have prepared students a little bit better. 
Um, mm -hmm. Maybe even giving them their five or ten minute mini lecture at the beginning, if that eased them into this format a little bit different. Because it was, it was a continuation course, so they had already had a semester where they were so used to the lecture format in organic chemistry. And it was the beginning of the semester, and I just feel like maybe they needed more explanation of why we were doing this, or maybe a little bit eased into it a little bit more. Yeah, I do that. I have a little... And a little opening at the beginning of my class where I talk about this is how I've set the class up, this is why. This is, this is what I'm hoping to accomplish with this. This is why I think it's better than other potential ways you can do it. Um, to kind of motivate. It's almost like you have to sell the concept on them a little bit. Because as was brought up over here, they're just not used to it, right? It's, it's just different from what they expect. And I think that's what most of the resistance usually is. is just, it's just different. Hold <coughs> well, we'll back for questions. I'm interested in the question of workload. Did you just add stuff to what they do? My students already complained that they do that we ask too much of them, and I think it's partly true. Yeah. And if you removed, how did you decide what to remove? Are there things that naturally became unnecessary? Yeah, we were really worried about that. We ended up making the reading optional, the textbook readings, so, so it's a little bit like they could. Yeah. I mean. Um, and suggested here are the pages in the book that cover these similar topics if you find reading the textbook to be useful. And I have asked myself, you know, if I continue forward this with this, which I'd like to, and end up having most of the class periods flipped, then am I, what do I do about the textbook? Um, it's still really useful, actually, because it has a lot of sample, like practice problems in it, but in terms of the actual reading in the textbook. Because I, I felt that way, too, that I can't really require them to watch you know, 40 minutes often, divided into four pieces, but 40, four 10-minute videos, answer those questions, look at a practice problem before class, and read a really dense textbook. Um, so that's yeah. what... Well, it also adds, I mean, kind of the core, the core hypothesis behind the flip classroom is that in the other model, you would introduce material during class, right? That's their first exposure. And then they leave class, and then they practice and get feedback and work problem sets and try to make sense of that material. So flip is one metaphor. I don't know. It's a time shifting of sorts, right? The idea is you take that first exposure and you move it before class, and you take some of what would have happened after class in terms of working through problems, practicing with ideas, and moving that into class. But I guess so it is a question is, does that happen naturally, or is this, you know, are does it become obvious what those things are? I don't think it's obvious. I would say I, I made that mistake early on. So one of the things, one of the mistakes I made at first was I probably, I, I overdid it with the work. Like I got, I got lots of comments about this class is a lot of work. And the way I think I've now kind of come into it was a little bit of what I alluded to. Whereas, so before, the way the class was set up is lecture ahead of time. And then outside of class, everybody works on this case, and they do the write-up, and they hand the write-up in before the next class, and then the class is a debrief going over the case that they have submitted at the beginning of class. And now I've set it up, so we have, you know, class one is I lecture and tell them how to do it. Outside of class, they work on the case. They turn it in before class, and then during class, we go over what the answer was. Now instead, what I have is we have two full classes of integrating, working on the case, and going over the material, and then they turn the write-up in after that such that they should have had a big, long head start on the case. And so I think that's the way I've kind of solved that problem of they're still basically doing the same things, but they're shifting a lot of that work on the case that would have been beating their head against the wall to in class, let me stick my hand up in the air and ask somebody. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that makes that closes the loop a little bit faster. That's just an example from my class. I don't know how transferable that is, but that's kind of the way it worked for me. But I, do, I mean, I didn't get that to my third try. That's what I mean by it's like a little bit of trial and error. I, I, I didn't have that the first two times, and I think now I've kind of stumbled upon it, and I think that's the way to do it. Well, and I think what Derek said is, is very correct. Usually, they either do it after class, or they wait till right before the exam, so just decide to just cram all this stuff in and practice. And what we're trying to do is make them do it in class where they have all this help. So a lot of the comments I got where it's a lot more work we have to motivate myself, they're having to motivate themselves weeks before their exam. So. I would say it's probably about the same amount of work because we tried to do like 15 to 20 minutes of video and we opted out of the formative questions because we didn't want to give them extra work. So we tried to minimize their time before class. Um, but when, if, if they do this correctly, then they don't have to cram out right before the exam. And just to piggyback on that, I saw a really interesting study out of Brown where they, they, they looked at that very issue, cramming, in a kind of traditional model versus flipped 
semi-control group experiment. And what they found that was that, indeed, um, they could kind of measure the amount of cramming that went on, and it, it reduced under the flip class model. Um, which I think is really interesting because typically, this is also results from literature, that when students are cramming, right, it's good for short-term recall, but not good for long-term recall. And so I think this redistribution of time, if we can help students work a little bit more along the way so they don't need to cram as much, um, you're likely to get better long-term learning gains from that. And so I think in terms of the workload time management, I think that's something to, to right, because I think students sometimes don't think about the eight hours they spend the night before the test. Right? If you distribute that over time, it may not be much more time, in fact, that we're asking them. Right. Yeah, it's just distributed better. Right here? Uh, I have a question. I taught undergrads, master's students, and PhD students. And the level of motivation is completely different. So I don't know if this method is better for people who only care about getting a better grade, like some undergrad student, or people like master that they are motivated by the content per se. That's a good question. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, I think some of the things we're talking about are, you know, when we're saying help students do things sooner, help students keep up with things, again, this is sort of, you know, now that I have a daughter who's 18, I'm getting it a lot more. <laughs> like, I really, um, you know, they're still kids, right? And they're still learning a lot of these things. And so I think it, it does help them you know, it maybe is in some ways most beneficial for them because, well, I don't know if it's most beneficial, but very beneficial because it does force them to have to do things in real time. Um, and, um, you know, whether they're doing that just to get the grade or, I mean, I would hope that we can present it in a way, that's one of the reasons I try to present examples in class that have to do with human disease because students tend to, relate and be more interested in that than, like I said, in what color the lentils are. So, um, but, you know, I do think some of this is just, you know, forcing students essentially to do what we know is good for them, which is to do the problems ahead of time, practice these things over time, and um, because it doesn't seem to matter how many times you tell them you can't cram for this class if they don't have that sort of daily reason to get it done, I, I, I get it. They have a lot to do and a lot of things vying for their attention and they let it slide, so. This is kind of connected. There's also, uh, under here, I think in some cases there's an equity issue. A lot of first generation college students, a lot of students of color, um, studies have shown don't seek out assistance from peers outside of class mm -hmm. because they don't know that's a thing you should do in college to succeed. Right? Or they feel like I have to show that I've got what it takes myself, so I'm not going to form a study group. Right? I'm going to figure this out myself. Um, and that's problematic, because a lot of the other students are working collaboratively outside of class mm -hmm. and learning from each other and working through their questions. Mm -hmm. And so one advantage of doing this is to shift some of that collaborative time in, inside of class to kind of bless it and say, no, this is actually how learning happens, and you should be doing this. Um, and so it's not a, it's not a direct, but, but often that kind of motivational um, and kind of savviness about how to learn and, and kind of the, the determination to push through, that does change, I think, once you leave the undergraduate level. But at the undergraduate level, I think this is something that we have to attend to. In the back. I have a question about individual differences. So some students work a lot faster and get concepts a lot sooner than other students. What are strategies have you used to deal with that while you're working with students in the classroom? Keep students that can get some material sooner still engaged? and not allow students who might not be able to do it in the last time to stay ahead. We made our workshops uh, more difficult as we went along, so our back page was extremely difficult. So if the student was really good, they got to the back page and they got stuck for the rest of the class. <laughs> Unless they were really good. So they gave them really challenging problems to chew on. And the other students, we labeled it challenge problems. So if if they could just make it through most of the packet, then they got the core concepts and they didn't feel like, you know. So we, we tried to give them the advanced students enough to chew on through the whole class and the others just enough to get the material. I address it a little bit with circulating around because I can. I mean, it, it depends a lot on the so class size. I mean, bigger classes, I think you have to do something like that. When you have smaller classes, I mean, I. Um, I know enough about my cases to know that, you know, if I, I get to a student and we still have 20 minutes left and he's basically done, I, I, in my mind, I've got three more things he can do. It's like, why don't you try this, and why don't you try this, and why don't you try this, and I'll be back in 10 minutes. And then, 
you know, other students that are struggling, I actually can spend a little bit more time in class, or sometimes maybe even, you know, pair those two together and say, hey, why don't you guys talk to each other? But that's, I have a little bit of a luxury being able to do that, so. Well, I think this model of asking students to work with the others around them, I mean, um, you know, it's, there's no way you could, it, you're, it's some serendipity, right? Because you can't say, oh, I need this advanced student to sit next to this student who isn't as advanced, right? But, you know, I think if students are just sitting there, even if you ask them a question, the really good students are, you know, often actually not going to answer because they don't want to keep raising their right. hand. They're being, and um, I mean, occasionally they do, but most of the time they don't. And so they're then really at danger of being bored. But if you, if you allow them five minutes that they're going to work together with their neighbor, then they can get in the teaching role mm -hmm. and actually help out their neighbor and keep them engaged as well. So I think that, you know, that is, can be helpful. And that by itself is higher level learning, right? Yeah, that if, if you're going to that point where you're instructing someone else on how to do it, your advanced student is getting that greater challenge. Right. Oh, I have sort of a pragmatic question or a couple like related to making the videos and everything. Like, how much for each your 10 minute segments just to get an ideal to time investment? How, how much prep did it take and how many takes did you do? <laughs> also, is there certain software that you use? Like, yeah. and also, like, if you were to make videos with just the PowerPoints and you write on it versus you're appearing in the video, like, Oh what God, I'm never going to appear in the video. I'm never going to appear in the video either. <laughs> she, she put her face in there. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I mean, I tried appearing in my video, but because I have, I mean, the, the bull program is wonderful, but it doesn't provide, I mean, I, well, I don't know. Maybe we don't have videographers to throw at it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, so the extended video myself would be talking at my computer and I tried putting it high and low and I just looked terrible no matter how I did it. So, um, so that, that settled that. But, um, and I actually, the way I do the videos is the same way we lecture in class. And so we have um, some software, it's from Interwrite, um, and uh, I haven't found, we did buy that from the company, I haven't found a good free source of something similar to that. And what it does is allow you to annotate over whatever you have on your computer. And then what's really great is it'll save it as PDFs. And so we lecture, and then we can save everything that we did during class as a PDF. So I just use that same software and that same style. And um, what I'm writing on is actually just a bamboo pad. So it's just one of these um, bamboos. The the name of the company. Wacom. Wacom, yeah. yeah. It's a tablet. It's just a tablet that you can write on, hook into your computer. Um, and then the capture is through a free program um, oh, called Screencast-O-Matic um, that um, you can download a free version. You can buy a professional version if you want, but I, you really don't need it. And um, it just it, it's limited to about 15 minutes, but we don't want to go longer than that anyway. And you just hook it in. And then... Um, I don't try to make it absolutely perfect. It still isn't. You heard me going um a few times. But um, and then um, I actually don't know the software she was using, but I could find out. Mary Keithley got some software that would allow her to easily go in and edit the video. And you know, if I'd say, oh, I just messed that up. Let me start over. And then she would edit that part out. But for the most part, I I mean, I clearly create the PowerPoints and think about what I want to just say, but I would just sit down in a quiet room and just go for it. So, <laughs> I use Camtasia, which is a popular program. It's not free. I think it costs about $100, but it, it does all of that in one. It has editing. It links directly to YouTube. It'll generate MP3s for you. You can annotate afterwards. Um, early on, it took me a little while to get used to it, but now that, now that I'm used to it, I'm starting to use it more, actually. So a lot of times, um, let's say I was working an example problem, like I gave everybody an example problem and we're getting to the end of class, um, you know, and it's like five minutes to go in class, I'll just tell them, I was like, all right, look, you know, I will, I'll, do a, I'll do a video going through the solution and it'll be up on Blackboard at the end of the day. And I can go back to my office and I can basically do the example on a video and pop it up on Blackboard and I can do that in like five minutes. Right, that's what I, that's what, when I'd run out of time, I'd be like, oh, I'll just make a video of it. Right, then, that's actually maybe one of the hidden benefits of doing this is that you kind of, you get them used to this idea that video is one of the ways in which we can communicate. And so you kind of get these little extenders almost on the end where you can do stuff like that. And I've gotten good enough at it that, uh, I can whip that up pretty fast now. After this um, session, we'll post the, the video we're taking of the session onto the vital web page and probably point to from CFT. It will also put a small primer helping answer that question, Frank. But if you hear some of the more, more popular software choices and here's some online tutorials that kind of do some of these things. 
So that'll be available there relatively soon. And I'll add, yeah, if you, if you find the Mold Fellows program page, we've got a, a whole set of just links and information about tools and things to use. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely get that out. I had a kind of extended question of Frank's, um, probably to you, Kathy, because your class is most similar to mine, but to anybody, is the amount of effort it takes to do this as a trade-off to if you just put that amount of effort into making your lecture super awesome. Um, well, they're already super awesome. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's super awesome, but well, not worth it. They're there. already now, awesome. I, now, I have this idea that my lectures are dynamic and fun, and, and I keep them up to date, because if things change really rapidly in the history of 17th yeah. century science, I'm sure I can just make that adjustment. <laughs> of course, I don't that often change my lectures, but I have this idea they're very flexible. Whereas once you kind of put it down into video, it must, it must feel more set. But is that the case? Do you feel that you are uh, as flexible, but, or is the, be the benefit that you are putting so much more attention into making that the right video? Yeah, I actually think it's that latter part, because I've had to think pretty hard about exactly what I want to put in each of those videos, and then again, how I'm going to coordinate that with class. Um, the other thing I've thought about is that, again, we do t have genetics being taught in the fall and in the spring, and if I'm going to do this, I would like these videos to be usable for whoever is teaching genetics, which will be a total of four instructors, two in the fall and two in the spring. And so that's another reason for doing it in these modular form, because in the fall, it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, and in the spring, it's a Tuesday, Thursday class, so I can't even say, here's the module for, you know, the session four, because that isn't the same as session four in the fall. And so, but I think we can easily mix and match these, um, these modules. Um, one thing I, I've been thinking about, and I, it might come a little bit to Emily and what the student was saying about wondering where their tuition dollars are going. I mean, I have um, Likes, you know, I was very insistent that I be the one who make the videos for m for my class. Now Mark now is teaching, and the videos are me. But the students know it's me, and I came and talked to them, and they know we're doing this project, and so they know that it's the professor who made the video. And I wonder sometimes whether some of that reaction by the students is they feel like they don't really know who made the video or or who approved it or put the ideas in and that sort of thing. And so with me, it's very clear that I made the video. So. And to me, it was important to be my voice for that reason. Um, I didn't want any students to feel like I was sort of just getting rid of my teaching duties by having someone else make a video. I, I don't know if that's. I think you can also talk to them about it, right? I mean, it's like it's just an information delivery mechanism. I mean, like yeah. if you want to save money on tuition, you know, don't pay it to us. Just go buy a bunch of textbooks and read them, right? right? I mean, or a library card. Right. I I, I don't like I I don't entirely know how to answer the question, I guess, that, like, what, you know, what, what is the most valuable use of class time? Like, usually it is direct interaction with someone who knows a lot more than you, like, and, you know, at a distance, arm's length, reading a book or watching a video is not that, so, I try to, in my beginning setup, I try to talk about that a little bit, because I know that that question's coming, but I think, if you think through it a little bit, I, I don't think it's a very deep and lasting critique of the model. And I'll be a little provocative here. If all we're doing in the classroom is providing explan explanations of things, right? right? Increasingly, there are well-produced yeah. videos available online for free that can provide those explanations and introductions yeah. to things. And so I think as, as higher education, we have to think a little bit about kind of what value we add to the process um, and the interactions that we're able to have with, among our students and with our students during class, that's much harder to replicate for free online. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's where we bring a lot of value. And so if we can use video and other mechanisms to shift some of that uh, kind of content delivery outside of class and free up more time mm -hmm. um, for the stuff that students can't get anywhere else, um, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's a tension we need to respond to as, as, as higher education. Any last comments? Probably? I think we should probably um, thank our speakers. All right. And hand up for the day.